Welcome back. You may have noticed that I am not George Curtis, but this still is It's Your Law. My name is Beth Osowski, and I'm an associate working at Curtis Law Office, and today we decided to do something a little bit different for this segment. For years, you've been watching George Curtis interview governors and senators and attorney generals and lawyers from all around the area so they could tell you a little bit about what they do and how it impacts your law. But you haven't rarely had the opportunity to hear from George Curtis and what he does and his experiences with the law. So today, we decided to turn the tables a little bit and not just because we wanted you to see George's better profile. We decided to let you hear from him about his experiences. So George, welcome to your own show. Well, it, thank you, Beth, for having me on the show. And of course, you should <laughs> add that uh, this means that you didn't have to prepare a segment by the, turning the tables on me. This is true, and I'm interested to find out what it is we're going to talk about yeah, today. Right. Well, well uh, you're the moderator. Great. Well, what I thought would be interesting for us to hear is, you know, you've been practicing for several decades. H how have you seen the law change throughout the years? Well, one of the changes, I think, is that, uh, frankly, students of the law, graduates of our law schools, are much better prepared, really better educated than ever before, and they're equipped to be better lawyers. Now, having said that, a smaller and smaller percentage of them really practice law, because with the knowledge and the expertise they have, they recognize that there are ways they can use their legal education much more profitably than serving the public. When you serve the public, typically it takes at least five years to establish a niche of expertise. It probably takes 10 years to build a reputation or a practice if you're fortunate enough to stay in one location. Most people aren't fortunate enough to stay in one location because they have spouses, and those spouses have careers, and if they have to pick up and move communities, they really start over. A good deal of the work that we do as practicing attorneys is free work. Some of it intended to be free, much of it <laughs> intended to help people out and hope we get paid, and unfortunately, the, the people we serve are largely poor people because they have the most legal needs because they haven't been able to afford advanced legal advice and prophylactic care. So the profession of law has become the business of law and not a very good business for most people. They could take their expertise as you could and you could be a professor most anywhere you wanted to be and work half the hours, probably for just as much money. Or you could go into industry, and if you were willing to work the hours that uh, we have to to be successful in the law practice, triple the money and have something called pension, profit <laughs> sharing, retirement, and that sort of thing. I'm almost 72 years old, still practicing law, still probably working 75 hours a week. And while I love it, uh, most of my classmates, the last two class reunions were retired. And um, <coughs> so the economics of the business have uh, really discouraged a lot of people. I would say the first five years, probably 40% of our class was practicing law. By the last reunion, not 2% are practicing law because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of risk. It's a lot of expense and not usually a lot of money connected with it if you're really helping the people who need to be helped. Now the final straw that I've observed is the Kmart factor. <laughs> the blue light special. The blue light <coughs> special. You know when I started practicing law in Merrill and then I practiced in Fort Lauderdale a little bit and, and in Madison before coming here in Oshkosh, uh, people came to you because you did a good job you did a good job for their Uncle Fred, and Fred mm -hmm. said, uh, you go to George, he'll do a good job for you. That isn't how people get clients anymore. Now it's television, it's radio, it's uh, uh, yellow pages, it's solicitations that are sent to people who have tragic accidents, it's mm -hmm. joining organizations, it's having unions shill business to you. It is on the same level as a used car lot, and it's expensive. 
It really means an, an additional pressure on the economic model of a law firm instead of spending three to five percent on promotion you're spending 25 percent of each dollar that comes on promotion having said all of that there are lots of changes four of my kids are lawyers <laughs> and, and um, I encourage young people to do it just don't ask me why okay well, speaking of people who are, are trained as lawyers but never practice law and certainly fitting in with expenses and advertising and a lot of the things you were talking about, we're within a year of the next presidential election. Yeah, I believe by my count, nine of the 17 main candidates running for office for the Republicans and the Democrats are trained as lawyers, and, and one of them actually played one on TV as well, if I recall. <laughs> now, these people, it, I believe that you've probably practiced law more than all of them combined. And I, I sense there's so many lawyers, I think that we will probably be facing more questions about what we call tort reform, you know, those people saying there are too many lawsuits and juries give too many high verdicts. I, I, I suspect they will have lots of those questions in the next year. What, as a, a practicing lawyer with more experience and knowledge than all of them combined, what do you wish they knew and what do you wish they were brave enough to actually tell the American public about tort reform and civil litigation in our country? Well, tort reform is a sham. It is absolutely a fraud that's uh, presented by the wrongdoers, and those companies that subsidize the wrongdoers, largely insurance companies, uh, the medical profession, manufacturers of products and things like that, to try to take away the right of ordinary consumers to the courthouse. And so they attack the lawyers, which has become very popular. Mm -hmm. They attack the idea of the contingent fee, which is the right of a poor person to go to court. A rich corporation already has lawyers on, on the staff. And they try to pretend that there's some kind of a litigation explosion and that there's a, a lot of deserving doctors being put out of business uh, uh, with medical malpractice and that it's costing our economy and that's why our products are being manufactured abroad and that products manufactured abroad don't compete on an even level playing field with products that are manufactured locally and of course absolutely none of that is true uh, the products liability law is the same and the standard is the same no matter where the product is made the uh, cost of medicine for example in Wisconsin for the consumer is the second highest in the United States and the cost of med mal insurance is the second lowest in the state because only Wyoming has had fewer medical malpractice cases. Contrary to what the insurance industry said, doctors are swarming to come into Wisconsin because of the quality of life and because of the chances of being successfully sued for malpractice in Wisconsin are far smaller than moose sightings in Beaver Dam. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, they that sounds like a good place for us to tie up, George. I really appreciate you being on. I will have to have you on your own show again some other time to, well, to continue this discussion. Well, please invite me back. I will yes. do that. Thank you. <laughs> and now George will be back sitting on, in this chair in just a few moments, interviewing, I'm sure, one more fabulous guest.